We are from corner to corner. I see that. Eric, thanks for coming here today. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. Got your way over there in the corner. Hey, on this side too, we've got them all the way. So thanks for being here. This is our last class of the quarter. And uh, next week, we will be starting out uh, in, in the auditorium, just be one adult class uh, and a new converts class, actually. But we have just one adult class here in the auditorium, and that will be a worthy walk. And uh, as we normally do during the summer, we're going to have uh, the different men of the congregation who will be teaching uh, one week uh, each Sunday. And I uh, want you to come and be a part of that and encourage them and help them as they uh, present some of these guys have some experience, some are new, so uh, be nice to them when they're up here. Don't treat them like you treat me when I'm standing up here. Um, and, uh, and then on Wednesday nights, um, in another week and a half, we'll begin our summer series. We have 13 different guest speakers from around Central Florida, preachers who've uh, been invited to come and be with us. And uh, each Wednesday night, they will be answering uh, questions that people ask, and uh, uh, their sermon or lesson will be centered around that, be an evangelistic thrust behind it, because there'll be fundamental type of questions that they'll be uh, examining. So we're glad you're here to, with us today, um, and I want to invite you to bow with us as we start in prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today, and uh, thank you for the great, great news this morning of already having a, a brand new sister in Christ to have one baptized today. What a wonderful news, a wonderful piece of information and joy that is, I know, in your presence, and it is for us as well and for, uh, for the whole family. We uh, are thankful, Lord, that we're a part of something that's just uh, doing so well, and, and you're doing so much here at Central uh, we're thankful for every single person that shows interest and a desire to learn for all of these baptisms that we've had over the last uh, a few months and just the excitement that it has brought here. We pray that you'll continue to bless us and do a mighty work. Uh, please be with us as we study today and uh, help us to be the kind of people you want us to be as we talk about reaching out to others. In Jesus' name we're praying and amen. So, I should have said to begin with, but Elena Sumashan uh, was baptized into Christ this morning, uh, right before services. She is uh, Delia's mother. Uh, oh, she is right behind my wife. So, there she is. She even waved to you, okay? So, she, she's waving again. So, uh, what a thrill it is for us to be a part of that, to see that and witness that, but to announce that and to know what joy it brings into the uh, presence of the angels. Did I say your last name correctly? Okay, good. Okay, that's all that Romanian training I've had in the past uh, that <laughs> that did that. No. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Delia. So, uh, but that is wonderful news, and we've been talking about all quarter long the one purpose that God wrote the Bible and gave it to us, and that is that He was He's been reaching out to man. That's. That's what God has always designed, has always purposed to do. He, uh, he wasn't under any obligation, but God chose to do this, and God chose to reach out to man and to offer to him salvation, provide for him the way to salvation, and that's what we read about. And so, uh, this morning, we've, uh, we've reached the point of the last class of this quarter, as I mentioned. So far, we've looked at the Gospels, which are more missionary sermons, they're they're not strictly biographies, as I mentioned to you. There's very scant detail as far as just a few days in the life of Jesus that are actually covered. But the main purpose between, behind Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to write to mankind a, a, a history, a brief history of who Jesus is, but more from the standpoint of saying, so you need to come to Him. You need to follow Him, and He's offering to you salvation. Now, the book of Acts is a missionary or evangelistic history or journal of Christianity as it began to spread from its beginning all the way until it reaches the uttermost parts of the earth. And the epistles, <clears throat> as we've gone through so far, among other things, cover as a primary element the, the need for evangelism to continue, for them to be encouraged and strengthened and continue to walk in the faith. So, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at the book of Revelation, and we're going to look at God's purpose in writing the book 
of Revelation. It's written near the end of the first century. Revelation is a journal of missionary struggles, I would suggest to you, under the heavy hand of Roman persecution, political persecution and religious persecution that came upon the church. Uh, it appears by all indicators that Rome, at the time that the book of Revelation was written, that Rome is so absolutely powerful that it looked like Rome was going to be able to extinguish Christianity altogether. That They were persecuting Christians, they were dragging them into, uh, putting them in prison, they were carrying them off, they were killing Christians in the first century, all because of their faith, just because they were Christians. And so it looked like Ro Romanism was going to finally, ultimately extinguish Christianity. In that fact, that's what they were trying to do. And so there was within the first century church this great fear of what's happening, what, what's going on, and, and how do we stay, should we stay faithful? Is this all real, or is this all going to be done away with? Is Jesus going to come back in the next few days or weeks or even maybe months or years? Um, they, they didn't really know what to do. Um, and so I'm persuaded the book of Revelation was primarily written for that purpose, to give encouragement to those Christians who felt like they were going to lose everything. Uh, John, who is the author of the Revelation, is an aged apostle, and he has been exiled to a little rocky crag of an island called Patmos in the Aegean Sea. There's not much to it. He's there. So the question is, what, what horrendous thing did John do that would get him exiled and and kicked out and, and placed on this little rocky island of a prison. What did he do? That's right. In chapter 1 and verse 9 of the book of Revelation, he is there, he says, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John's arrested. John is imprisoned on this little island of exile now away from all these things that could be going on about him and reaching out. So, let's start out this way. Let me ask you, by the way, I'm, you notice I didn't ask any questions. I got so many complaints about the 10 questions that I asked each week, and I live with her. No, I'm joking. It wasn't Melissa. <laughs> it wasn't Melissa. That we just are going to forgo those today. You, you hurt my heart, but don't worry about that. No, you didn't. All right, so, so John is going to write this letter to these churches, these seven churches that he dictates. But I want you to think about John for a minute. John's been called by Jesus Christ. He's accompanied himself with Jesus for a little over three years. Jesus now has been crucified. Jesus has been resurrected. John has been preaching, and John gets arrested and he gets put on this little rocky island out here, this, this prison, as it were. What would be the potential of John's feelings at that time? If you're John, here's what you, I mean, you've seen this, you've done this, you've been a part of this, and now you've been put in prison for preaching and teaching. What, what would be the, the possible feelings that you would have? Huh? Bitter? Okay, right? It, what, what's, what's with all of this? Why, why did this happen? Okay, what did I do wrong? And how, you know, I, I thought things were going to be different. So I must have done something wrong that got me arrested or whatever. But what else would you feel? Right? Okay, yeah, that's right. That, that some of the other apostles have already been killed for preaching and teaching. And so now I've been exiled to this island. Did he feel like, whew, uh, you know, I escaped the sword? Or does he feel like, um, wh why is this all happening? You said discouraged, okay. Uh, that would be true. What else can you think of? I mean, put yourself in that situation. How would you feel sitting in a prison for preaching and teaching? Happy? Excited? What's that? Okay, yeah, and when we fall into trials and temptations, but I mean the temptation would not be to count it joy. The temptation would be to feel despondent, to feel alone, to feel rejected, to feel 
uh, you know, again, like, we, like you already said, what, what did I do wrong to create this and bring this about? So I think this is the reason why the Lord gives this revelation to John, and not just to John, but preserves it for us and for all time. So that when we hit our moments of discouragement, our moments of despair, our moments of loneliness, our moments of despondency, and we look up maybe and wonder, why is this happening? Oh, what did I do wrong? I was just trying to do the right thing. I was just trying to teach somebody, or I was just trying to preach to somebody. Why does this happen this way? Jesus provides this revelation to give us an answer as to what we should do and how we should think. Now, the normal reaction to the book of Revelation for most people is fear. They think about the book of Revelation and they're afraid. Uh, uh Oh, no, that's got all those weird things in it. And and there's symbolism that we don't know exactly what this is, and, and, when, and we try to put it all together. And sometimes we want to know what's in it, but we're kind of afraid of it. And we think it's a book of mystery. But what is the name of the book? Revelation. Okay, It is a revealing, it is, it is a laying open or laying before us what the answer is. So rather than think it's so mysterious and so shrouded in, in haunting clouds and mystery... What I should look at this and say is, what is this book teaching? What is the point of this book? And the point of the book, look in chapter 1 and at verse 3, blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy of this book and keep the things that are written in it for the time is near. So there is a blessing that is given or extended to us when we read or hear and we keep the words that are written in this book. It's designed to encourage and bless us rather than to make us think, ooh, I don't know, I, don't, I can't deal with revelation. So, so let's look at this. I want to suggest to you a few things this morning just as we quickly go through. I'm persuaded it's written to encourage us. So look in chapter 5 and verse 13. Uh, the question is, if you're living in first century Rome and you're a Christian, is Rome in control? I mean, is Rome the one who's, who's ruling over everything? Because it sure looks like Rome is. I mean, it looks like Christianity is on its way out. It looks like the Romans are going to completely stop Christianity and be done with it. So look at verse 11, chapter 5 and verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that has been slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every created thing which is in heaven or on the earth or under the earth or on the sea and all things that are in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing the honor the glory and the dominion forever and ever and then the four living creatures were saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped and it seems like this cycle just happens again and again and again but the point of this is who is actually in charge who is actually ruling in all of this god is Rome is not the one in control, even though it may look like Rome is in control. God is the one who is absolutely, completely in control. So John, if I'm to put myself in John's shoes on the island of Patmos, feeling maybe, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to feel. Well, what the Lord is telling me is God says, I've got this thing. I I am in absolute and complete control. Rome is not in control. I am in control. So What kind of encouragement would that give to somebody? Okay, I mean, it should be a huge boost of encouragement that says, okay, even though I can't figure this out, even though I don't understand what's going on around me, I know God is in control. I know God has this, and so I can put my trust in God. I can rely on God. I know His promises are true. I know what He has told me will come about even though I maybe can't see it at this moment. Yes, Elaine. Uh 
Okay. Okay, what a beautiful picture. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised <laughs> to hear that of Gary, but, but that's a beautiful picture of him saying, I just want this confirmation again and again and again, this reminder that says, even though I don't get all that's happening right this moment, or I don't feel it at this moment, but here's what is true, and I know that's true. That's a beautiful testimony for, for Gary. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so, I, I mean, I should be joyful over this. Go back to the chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. So John is on the island of Patmos. He's been exiled there as we said. And then he says beginning at verse 9, Revelation 1 and verse 9, I John your brother and fellow participant in the tribulation and in the kingdom and the perseverance of Jesus was on the island that is called Patmos because of the Word of God and because of the testimony of Jesus. Now, if anybody understands tribulation, John does. He understands the trials and the tribulation of going through all this, perseverance, holding on. But now look at verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I think, he, I think he's in the spirit of worship is what he's talking about here. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. If you hear a loud voice behind you, what do you do? You turn around and look, okay? I only bring this up because he says he hears this loud voice behind him, and he says, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write on a scroll what you see, send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea, verse 12, and then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And turning, now remember, this is in visions, it's verse 4 says it was signified, made known by signs and symbols. I turned and saw this behind me, and he says that there was, after turning I saw seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. And in the middle of the lamp stands, I saw one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a robe reaching down to his feet, wrapped around his chest was a golden sash, his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like unto burnished bronze, as though it had been heated to a glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And it is quite understandable that verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This is, a, this is a, an awe-inspiring vision that John has. Here is Jesus in his glorified state. How had he looked before? Prior to this, what had John seen? Yeah, he sees a man hanging on a cross, dying or dead. Now here is Jesus in his glorified state, standing in all of the brilliance and grandeur that God and his majesty has. John must have been greatly encouraged and swelled up by that great, great encouragement. Then what he is told to do is write these seven letters. Look at chapter 2 and at verse 7 as he writes to the church at Ephesus, the very end, the last sentence of verse 7, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Drop down to verse 11. It says, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is to the church at Smyrna. The one who overcomes will not be hurt in the second death. Drop down to verse 17. This is to the church at Pergamum or Pergamus. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone of acquittal, and the new name that was written on the stone which no one knows except the one who receives it. Look at verse 26. To the church at Thyatira, 
the one who overcomes and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are shattered, as I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Look at chapter 3 and at verse 5. <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 5, where it says, The one who overcomes will be clothed the same way in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, which I will confess and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That was to the church at Sardis. Then to the church at Philadelphia. Look at verse 12. Chapter 3 and verse 12. The one who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. And then in chapter 3 and verse 21, the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat <coughs> excuse me, and sat on his throne. So, did you see a key or a theme in any of those? To him who overcomes. The overcomers is who he's talking to. If you overcome, and we can be thankful to know that Jesus has overcome this world. So, so he says to you, if you overcome, what happens? Okay. And, and he will bless you forever. It's an eternal blessing. I'll give you the white robe. I'll give you a stone of acquittal. I'll give you a new name. I'll give you. I'll make you a pillar, a part of the, the the very temple of God. Over and over, all these different blessings to say, "I will bless you. I will take care of you. I will provide for you if you remain faithful." So it's written. I'm persuaded to encourage Christians to hold on, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of suffering, like they have. Chapters four and five. After he dictates these letters. Chapters 4 and 5 show us that God is on the throne, as we read and we concluded at the end of chapter 5. But the picture is, you don't need to worry. It's not Rome who's in charge. God is in charge. He's on the throne. He's reigning. He's ruling. That's what we need to see, and that's what we need to understand. Because everything shifts at chapter 6, chapter 6 through 18 in the book of Revelation, is written about the political persecution and the religious persecution that's coming upon Christians, that they are facing horrendous challenges. <clears throat> chapters 4 and 5 set the stage, and then in chapters 16 through 18, it again looks as if Rome is winning, but the false religions and the struggling band of Christians who are there are told to hold on and to, to remember that God is in control. So, in chapter 13 and verse 1, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, dropping down to verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The sea beast and the earth beast, representing the Roman persecution of political power and government, and the religious persecution that came from the false pagan religion of Romanism, he said, I saw these things come up, but what's the end of the story in Revelation to these beasts? They lose. They're destroyed. They're cast into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. So, over and over again, it's to say, hold on. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't, don't turn back from God. So, let me ask, anybody know of anyone who started out their life as a Christian and their walk as a Christian and turned back? Yeah, sadly, sadly, if you've been a Christian very long, you could name names, maybe within your own family, loved ones, people that you know, how about her who used to sit here or he who used to sit over there, whatever, those kinds of memories come to us. People who were once faithful and through whatever means in their life gave up. Maybe it was some trial they faced. Maybe they just got tired. Maybe it was the attraction of this world. I, any number of things that got people off course. And what he's telling them is to hold on. 
hold on, don't give up. Look at chapter 14. Chapter 14 and verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with the eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. So the angel is dispatched to go do what? Okay. Well, he says, go out and preach, okay? Go out and preach this message to them. God is reaching out. He's still reaching out to man. God's one eternal purpose has, to be, has been to reach out to man. So, look at verse 8. And another angel, a second angel, followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. I'll suggest to you Babylon references or is representing Rome here. She who has made all the nations to drink of her wine and the passion of her sexual immorality. So Babylon has fallen. What, what would that do for Christians who are struggling under Roman power? Yeah, give them hope because God says, I've got this thing. They're, Rome has fallen. Okay, it's, it's already been dictated. This would be written in what we might call prophetic perfect tense. It, it's a prophecy. It's stated as if it's already happened. But it hasn't happened yet, has it, when he wrote this? No. When they're reading this, they're still under the heavy hand of persecution. But God says, Babylon has fallen. I've got this. I've, I've taken care of it. I know I'm in control. I want you to know it's going to end, and I'm the one who's taking care of it all. Yes, ma'am. Right. That's exactly right. And, and, and the point of this is to say, just hold on. Don't ever, ever give up. I, I'm persuaded that's the, the simple message of the book of Revelation. You can say it in two words, Christians win. Okay? So the Christians win, and so since they win, I need to hold on. Okay? You ever watched a game, uh, maybe your favorite team's playing, and... and you know, you already know. This is already played. You've, you're watching a replay of the game. You already know that they win the game. But as it's going through, and you're at the second quarter, third quarter, and it looks like, man, we are getting stopped. We can't do anything right. So how nervous are you? You're not nervous at all. You know the end of the game. You know, okay, we came through, and we finally, the fourth quarter, turned it around, and then whatever it is that we think in our own mind, that's what this is doing here. So say, here's the end of the story. The Christians win. So don't give up. Don't, don't give in and don't turn back from this. So look in chapters 19 to 22. The last section of this. Chapters 19 to 22 are the victory that comes in Christ. I'm persuaded, by the way, that the whole book of Revelation was basically fulfilled in the first century. It's, it's not something that's looking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in the future, that it's, it's all been taken care of. God's got Rome. He's taken care of this fourth kingdom. So at ch chapter 19 and verse 1, after these things, I heard something like a loud voice, a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great prostitute, that would be Rome and the Roman religion and all of that, who has been corrupting the earth with her sexual immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures who were around the throne they fall down and they worship God who sits on the throne and they say, Amen, Hallelujah. And a loud voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all of you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. See, God rules, God reigns, God's in charge, God's in control. 
even though it doesn't look this way. Even though it doesn't look this way today, does it? I, I don't know if you all know this, but we're in the midst of a political um, election year. I don't know if you knew that. Um, and there is division <laughs> in our country. Uh, I mean, it, it's always been there, but it seems to have been over the last 10, 20 years much more stark in its division uh, but the point of this is some people look at it and say, well, if he gets into office, then there goes the whole country. If he gets into office, oh, there goes the whole country. No matter what side we're on, that's the feeling that most or many, I should say, people have. And the real answer to all of this is what? God is in control. It really doesn't matter. Uh, let, me, let me temper that a little bit. It can matter, okay? Let me say that it doesn't ultimately matter who's in the White House or in the State House. What's more important, what God's more concerned about is who is in your house. And if He is the God of your house, then it really doesn't matter who's in office. We're talking about Christians who were living under severe, harsh persecution in the first century. Not like what we face today horrible persecution, people being dragged off, babies being ripped out of their arms to take and to burn or whatever the case is, just to get you to turn your back on Christ. At this point in our country, we don't face that. God is in control even in the U.S., even during an election cycle. Yeah, Drew. Right. Right. Yeah. And to say, I mean, for him to write this, I mean, it's for him, but also he writes it for us and others to say, hold on. Look, look, this is what it's going to be. I've seen, I've known, you've heard people say it before, oh, trust me, I've been through this before. John could have said that. I've seen these horrible things. I know this is the case, and this is what's happened. But God is still reaching out to man. Look in the 22nd, the last chapter of the book. In Revelation chapter 22, there's going to be an encouragement for us. At verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say what? Come. And let him who hears say what? Come. And let the one who is thirsty do what? Come. And let the one who desires to take of the water of life without cost. God still in the very last chapter of the very last book is saying, come. come. The bride's inviting you to come. The, the Spirit's inviting you to come. Come. God is reaching out. He's continuing to try to reach out to us and to reach out to all mankind. So all of these things have been written in this way. These words, notice at verse 6, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent His angel to show His bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This along with other verses telling me that the book of Revelation was written for the first century, about the first century, and about what they were going through. It's, it's not talking about World War II, Hitler, Mussolini. They're not in here. That's not what's talked about at all. What's being talked about is the Roman government that is so severe, so sore in their persecution against Christians that Christians are wondering, should I continue or just give up? And God says, hold on, don't give up, don't turn back. I'm in control. I, I've got this all taken care of. So, um, let's see here. So, ultimately, God's purpose in writing the entire Bible has been to reach out to man. That, that's what His purpose is. So, evangelism 
and, nor, uh, and, and numerical growth within a church should be the centerpiece of any church. It, it has to be, should be a critical centerpiece of any congregation. Sadly, there are lots and lots of churches across this land and other lands that have resigned themselves to the belief that they can't grow anymore. They can't, you know, the church, it's different today than it used to be, so the church can't grow. We can't, we can't evangelize. We can't do like we used to do. And, and so many of them have been satisfied with remaining just about the same level all along for years and years and years. Well, we might baptize one or two, and then we lose two or three, and we might baptize one or two and lose two or three. But preaching and teaching needs to be the centerpiece of every church and what we're trying to do. That's why we meet for Bible study like this. That's why we preach on Sunday mornings. That's why we have in-home small groups. That's why we have Wednesday night Bible classes. That's why we have um, other sources that we try to reach out. We're just trying to reach out with the message of Christ. That, that needs to be our purpose and our goal. Everything to try to give glory to God. Not to say, look at us or look at what we've done, but to give glory to God. So just to give you a, a little brief capsule, we are growing here. Uh, we've had uh, 14 baptisms so far this year. Uh, we are reaching out to other areas on Tuesday mornings now, uh, teaching a class on the west side of town at the... Um, at the hotel over there Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock. We're working to begin another one down in the villages that we're going to try to get going down there. Later on, later this year, we're hoping to maybe start one over in the shores, the area over there, because we're trying to reach out with as many avenues as we possibly can to share the good news of Christ, to try to reach more people and to help grow the kingdom. Not to say, look at us, look at what we've done or anything along those lines. It is God and it's God's work. And fortunately, we get to share and be sharers in that and be participants in that. I mentioned this before that when we did our three friends and family days a few weeks ago, we had over 200 guests between those three Sundays that you all invited and brought with you. That's you are to be commended for that. We're going to do it again in the fall, have three more weeks of Friends and Family Day. But, but, but don't wait till the fall to invite your friends and neighbors, okay? So I'm just letting you know that'll be a special target and focus uh, in those days. But to invite and to pray and to reach and to teach, that's what we're trying to do, to try to grow the kingdom, trying to make as much as many inroads as we can into the lives of people to help see them come to Christ. Hey, just hit the silence button, Andrew. Andrew, just, just hit the silence button in there or in the other one, and that should stop it. Uh, well, if you do it back here, you don't have to, in the elder's office. Uh, so, let me see if you all have any other questions or thoughts or anything that you want to share with us this morning from the book of Revelation or this quarter. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I mean, he got to see the physical, visible proof first and then tells him. I, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that because his last picture of him is dead or dying, and now he sees the glorified Christ in all of it. Well, I, no, I have to take that back. He did see the resurrected Christ. Um, I could see my, my wife going, what? No. Okay, so, but now he sees him in all of his glory um, as he is, gets this vision on the island of Patmos. Um, Okay, yes, ma'am. Well, bro Brother Dowdy used to preach one sermon, 40 minutes long, and preach the book of Revelation. So that, that's how it was done. Uh, go ahead, Diane. Right. 
Well, yeah, and we've been, we were talking the last couple of weeks over the Tuesday class on the other side of town. We've been going through First Peter, suffering and hope, and how we've emphasized the same thing. Happiness is based on circumstances, but we can have joy and hope because of who God is and because Christ, of who Christ is. God is on the throne, and so I can still have a lasting joy no matter what. Happiness is dependent upon my circumstances or situations around me. So, uh, that's good thought on peace as well. That's right. That's right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Pick a team and we already know which one wins. So let's pick a winner, you know? Okay. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Jake. It's amazing. All right. Yeah, I, I don't think that would make any sense or any difference at all if it was talking about the, you know, the Black Hawk uh, uh, helicopters, whatever, uh, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, World War One, World War Two, any of those things. If you were a first century Christian reading that book, what would you think? Not for me. Okay, <laughs> I mean, if it's going to be another 1,800 years before this even happens, um, this doesn't have a bearing on me and on my life. He was writing to people who were enduring horrible conflict, horrible suffering, telling them to hold on. And so if I endure suffering or conflict or trials in any way, I can, by application, take the same message for myself. David? No, I don't. I don't. I think it's talking about the destruction of Rome and the Roman government and the Roman persecution. I think it's written after, I believe it's written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I don't, personally, I don't think the book of Revelation is, is a hard book to understand. I think it's a simple book to understand. And I think that uh, you can be wrong if you want to, Dave, that's fine. No, I'm, I'm joking. That's what my father-in-law used to say. But anyway, you, but I, I, don't, I don't take that position of it writ, being written about the Jews. I think that the, who he had in his focus and who he had in his mind were the Romans who were persecuting the Christians. Jerry? That's, that's exactly right. And I, th I think whether we take an early date on the book of Revelation or we take a later date on the book of Revelation, the primary message is still, as David was suggesting, is still the same in that Christians win. God is the one who's in control. God will take care of all of these things. So, all right. So next week, as I said, we're going to have different speakers in here. I think Richard Riley starts us out next week. I'm not sure. Um, and we'll, we'll be going through that. So thank you for your participation and, and joining uh,